All right, so joining me now is the author of this book right here, You're Not Enough, and that's okay. It's Allie Beth Stuckey from The Blaze TV, host of the Relatable Podcast. Allie, thanks for joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. Well, I mean, you've gone after every single sacred cow here, I think, of uh, of secular culture and, in a lot of cases, sadly, Christian culture. So, um, you know, you are enough. I think this is a phrase, maybe, I guess, obviously, that triggered the book because that's the title. Um, but it's such a feel-good phrase, and there's so many of these things out there. But why don't we start with that one? Why is that one? I mean, we got Rachel Hollis fans, those types of people out there living by this type of phrase. Uh, why do you say it's it's a dangerous path to go down? Well, the people who use the phrase, I do want to make clear, I do think are well-meaning. I think that the motivation behind using the phrase or the encouragement that you're enough is to try to sway insecurity or any feeling of um, not, you know, not being competent or not being qualified or maybe not being a good mom or a good student or whatever it is. And it is really a rallying cry, I think, for women who maybe struggle with self-esteem and maybe struggle with self-deprecating and self-loathing thoughts. My problem with the phrase, you're not enough, is not that I want women to feel bad about themselves, not that I want them to feel inadequate or like they're not talented or that God has not given them strengths. But the reason why I have a problem with it is because it, uh, it encourages us to find our sufficiency and to find our confidence within ourselves rather than in the God who created us. Because the fact of the matter is, is that even if we are very good moms and we're really good at our jobs or we're athletic or whatever it is, uh, we're still going to come up short in one area. We're still going to find a way to feel insecure and small and not enough. And hearing Rachel Hollis or whatever author it is, Glennon Doyle, tell us over and over again, we are enough, isn't going to change that. The only remedy, the only antidote to our feelings of inadequacy and insufficiency and insecurity, which are very real, is God's all-sufficient love and grace. And we shouldn't seek to not feel uh, not enough. We shouldn't seek to feel like we are enough. We should recognize that we'll never be enough. And like my book says, that's okay. And in fact, that's good news because God's grace and God's love is sufficient for us and he doesn't call us to be enough for ourselves because he through jesus christ has become enough on our behalf yeah and isn't it sort of like a as christians obviously we understand we're living in a fallen world and, and when we try to adopt this sort of view as you're alluding to there uh, isn't it sort of a denial of our fallen state i, I mean i used to attend the village church yes. down in texas and matt chandler famously would go through the you know, you think you're nailing it. Like, let's go through the commandments here. And, you know, you would rattle off each one. It was like, you lie today. You know, did you cheat on anything? You ever stolen anything? And it's like, oh, yeah, geez, actually, I'm not that good. So I think the danger there is it not if we try to keep telling people that, hey, just look into yourself and it's going to be great. What you're going to see is, you know, a sinful person who makes a lot of mistakes. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that is really the core of the book and the core of why it's so important for Christians to speak against this. Because if you're enough, if I'm enough, then we don't need the gospel. We don't need Jesus. Jesus came to die and to reconcile us to God because we're not enough on our own. If we're enough on our own, then we don't need Christ as our reconcile, uh, reconciler, as our redeemer, and as the forgiver and the taker away of our sins. And so we're not enough and we get to rejoice in our weakness uh, because, like I've said, because God has sent his son to be our sufficiency and to be our intercessor and all that good stuff. But what you said also reminds me of something else that we talk about in the book is that there is this very kind of new age idea underneath this doctrine of the self, what I call trendy narcissism in the book, this idea of self-empowerment, of self-fulfillment, that all the happiness and satisfaction that you're seeking can be found inside yourself. And it is this very strange new age, so extra, bibli extra biblical uh, mystic idea that who you are deep down inside is really perfect. Who you are deep down inside, you've got this inner goddess somewhere in there. And if you can just shed society's expectations, if you can just uh, rid yourself of your fundamentalist background that maybe held you back when you were young, if you just get the right amount of therapy, do the right amount of exercises, 
or read the right book, then you'll find that perfect inner self that you can listen to and you'll finally be at peace and calm and you'll be able to accomplish all of your dreams. That's really the weird new age idea that's underneath uh, these self-help, self-love books. And the fact of the matter is we can go digging inside ourselves all day. All we're going to find, like you said, is a depraved sinner that's in need of a savior. Why do you think it is, Allie, that these self-help, self-love phrases, they're very popular. And so I commend you, first of all, for just tackling this topic because, um, you know, and I'm glad you found a publisher because honestly, I think the other sorts of topics are probably much easier to get somebody, you know, to, to, to bite on it. Um, but why do you think it is that people find those topics so popular, especially if we, especially Christians should know deep down that they're not true. I mean, for me, at least, I remember early in my college days when I was, quote unquote, trying to find myself. Uh, right. Thankfully, God sort of let me see the ridiculousness of the self-help section. I kind of somehow knew that I, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm like, why would I have all the answers to all this stuff? But, but anyway, why do you think so many people find this these ideas so appealing? Well, I think some of it is based in, like I said in the beginning, good intentions. And also there is a reality that women struggle in a different way. I don't even know if I can say more than, but in a different way than men do with insecurity. We feel like we are held to impossible standards of being a full-time mom and a full-time employee, of bouncing back right after we have babies, of not being too loud, but being just bold enough. And so I think a lot of women feel torn in several different directions, whether in their minds it's by the church or their parents or school or society, media, whatever it is. And so this is a very, the you're enough movement, the trendy narcissism movement, the you're enough for yourself, you're perfect to the way that you are, there's nothing you need to change about yourself, who you are deep down is perfect. All of those ideas are responses to very real burdens that women carry and we feel like they're too heavy. The problem is that's a secular response, that's a that's a, a, a non-biblical, an unbiblical response to those things. So these are real problems, real burdens. The problem with the you're not enough answer is that that is a godless answer to the problem of our burdens. Jesus already gives us the answer and it's him. He says, okay, yeah, the world is going to give you very heavy burdens and a very difficult yoke, but my burden is light and my yoke is easy. And we have tried, and by we, I mean Christian women in general, have tried to kind of Christianize this self-fulfillment, self-empowerment talk to say that Jesus just wants to come along and make you feel good about yourself and up your self-esteem. And unfortunately, people are going down that road and they're either ending up in the camp like, you know, a Jen Hatmaker or Glennon Doyle to where they're basically, you don't read any kind of formidable theology from them anymore, or they're just ending up completely unhappy and they're like okay i thought that i was supposed to feel good about myself going down this road of self-empowerment and bringing jesus along for the ride and they end up feeling just as lonely and just as confused as before good stuff and i remember you know to your point i watched a sermon from a pastor who i will not name but he's got a large house in north carolina that made news when he bought it <clears throat> um but uh, anyway he did like a whole sermon this one time and uh i went on for an hour and was telling people all these things that you talk about in the book, you know, you're enough, you know, you're the, you're great and this and that. And then he threw in at the very end, you know, Hey, and if you want to have Jesus accept, you know, if you want to accept Jesus as your savior, now's the time. And I, and I remember listening to that sermon going, how in the world do these people think they need a savior after hearing all of this, like popping right. up talk for the last hour? Um, right. So, I mean, I don't know what your reaction to, to those types of sermons is. Yes. So that's something else we talk about in the book is prosperity gospel, because it's a part of this kind of self-empowerment world that uh, if you do these things, you'll feel better about yourself and to kind of Christianize it. Yeah, Jesus is going to be the one to give you all of these things. But John Piper has said, which I think is it's so true that the problem with the prosperity gospel is that it gives you everything that your heart wants before you're a Christian. Like without Christ, you want all of that stuff. You want the big house. You want the fame. You want the self-empowerment. You want to feel good about yourself. If that's all, like you said, what Jesus offers, then why do you need Jesus? Why do you need to, you know, take up a couple hours on Sunday? Why do you need to read a Bible? Why do you need to 
what Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. If you can get everything that these prosperity gospel preachers say that Jesus offers you outside of Jesus, why even call yourself a Christian? But the fact of the matter is, is that as we know, Jesus gives us so something so much better and so much more satisfying, but it's the exact opposite message of what these preachers of self-fulfillment are telling us. It's self-denial. It's, it's self-sacrifice. Jesus says, if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people, because they are attracted to the allure of, oh, if I just pray the right way or have the right faith and all. I'll get the promotion, I'll feel better about myself, I'll have the self-esteem, whatever it is, they're missing out on the true abundant life that is only found through being a disciple of Jesus. What do you think, Allie, is out of all the kind of topics you cover, you, you cover several myths here, um, which one do you think is the one that the church is most susceptible? Because we know that secular society, you know, people are, you know, without a Christian worldview, you're sort of floundering and you're kind of looking to grab on anything. So I think you know, they're very susceptible to probably all of these myths, but particularly the Christian culture, because these they seep in there. Which one do you yes. think the church is, is most vulnerable to? It's, it's hard to say because they are all so interconnected. That was actually a challenge of writing this book is that mm. there are five different myths that particularly women, but men and women are confronted with by secular society and by the church, but they all overlap so much they build on top of one another but i would say the myth that's probably the most dangerous and maybe you could argue that this is even the myth that's underneath them all is that you define your own truth mm. you define um truth based on what feels good to you so my truth our truth your truth you can't argue with my truth because it's mine and it's truth and so i've got two trump cards and you can't say anything about it and that's what I use to justify all of my choices and the things that I think that make me feel comfortable. That is obviously very dangerous in the church. And that seeps in when you don't base your doctrine, your sermons, your how you run your church on the word of God. The only inerrant authority uh, that we have or that God has given us to base uh, what we say and what we do and our theology off of. And when we get away from that, when we start doing these kind of feel good sermons that are just meant to make people, you know, feel better about themselves rather than pointing them to God, that's when we get into the territory of exchanging the truth for my truth. And when you do that, it seems like all of these other myths seem to seep in. What uh, you you provide a lot of personal stories in this book um, to kind of illustrate. Uh, the, the topics that you're talking about. And why don't you give a little bit about your background? Because as I mentioned with me, I know that I, you know, as a young person, there's, I think all of us struggle with that, at least have that some, that moment where we're kind of trying to figure things out. And, um, you know, I guess yeah. a lot of people would say it's finding yourself. And um, if you're not connecting that to Christ, because I didn't really grow up in a Christian home. So I was kind of floundering looking for that until I, until God, you know, finally pointed me in the right direction. Um, but tell me a little bit about your background and if you had those sorts of struggles uh, in, in your earlier days. Yes. Yeah, so I was raised in a Christian home, two awesome parents that took my brothers and me to church every weekend. I went to a Christian school. And so I knew the gospel and I believed in God and um, I read my Bible sometimes. But it wasn't really until I was later in high school that I started to take things a little more seriously. And I didn't have necessarily a moment to where I said, OK, all of a sudden I feel like I wasn't taking it seriously and now I want to. It was more just a gradual learning of what the gospel is and, and what, uh, what the Bible looks like in application to my life. And so I started taking my faith more seriously towards the end of call or the end of high school. And it wasn't a straight line from A to B. So in college, I was known as, you know, the good girl. I was chaplain in my sorority. I led Bible studies. And then I went through a difficult breakup at the end of my senior year, middle of my senior year. And things just kind of went haywire for me. I went through a period where I said, you know what? I tried this of following God and, and walking the way that God wants me to walk. And now I've ended up heartbroken and I thought I was going to marry this person. I don't know who I am anymore. I realized I was putting my identity in this relationship and the thought of getting engaged and getting married soon. And I just kind of went down 
uh, thank God, a, a short, but a serious downward spiral to where I decided, okay, I'm just going to let loose. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to be who I want to be. I'm going to do what makes me happy. I'm going to find myself. So I started drinking more, going out, going on dates, all in an effort to do the things that made me happy because that's what I had been told would heal me, would make me feel better. I started working out more. I started losing weight and that developed into a pretty serious eating disorder. And this was all in an effort of self-discovery, of self-fulfillment, of doing things my way, of finding my truth, of doing what I thought would make me happy. And it ended up at the end of all of that completely breaking me to the point to where I was in a, a very, I was in a very precarious position with having an eating disorder and having engaged in this kind of unhealthy behavior where I had to finally, after a few months, say, okay, I can't keep going that direction if I want any kind of purposeful life. And it was by the grace of God that brought me back and uh, it helped me realize that I wasn't going to find the satisfaction that I was looking for inside myself, something that I reiterate a lot in the book and I find is true in my life every day. The self can't be both the problem and the solution. So if you are finding in yourself insecurity, addiction, whatever it is that you're struggling with inside, depression, anxiety, the the solution to that can't also be found in the self. It's got to be something outside of you because inside we are flawed, we are needy, uh, we are depraved, we don't have the answers and satisfaction inside of us. We've got to go outside. And thankfully, God used several tools, which I talk about in the book, and just ultimately his grace to bring me back to repentance and that was the experience that I learned just how dastardly and just how disappointing the journey of self-fulfillment is. That's a great testimony right there, Allie. And um, the book is You're Not Enough and That's Okay. This is it right here. I don't know if I get on the screen. There it goes. Um, and it's a great read. And, you know, my daughter's 15. I'm going to have her go through it. I mean, this is critical stuff here, Allie. And, and, I, and I thank you for tackling it because it is, I, I think, a foundational issue um for people to you know be contemplating because you're going to contemplate these questions one way or the other so um this is a great look and a great you know tool to point people uh to christ through it so ali thank you for joining us thanks for spending a few minutes here appreciate it